All right, here we go. Response to Earhart number three. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Sean and Carter have a podcast has spawned a spinoff starring Elaine and Ron, and they now do a not a podcast called Earhart. And they respond to things that we talk about and then also go on all kinds of tangents of their own. So, first thing, uh, you had a little discussion about Foursquare. I remember being really interested in Foursquare when it first launched, but at the same time, I was also really interested in Facebook and other social media experiences that now I've pulled completely away from and been like, no, take it away. Foursquare was one of the first ones that I was like, never mind, I don't I don't want to use this. This can be used to stalk me. This can be used to figure out when I'm not home. This can be used to... I didn't like it for privacy reasons, so I got rid of it pretty quickly. Uh, you talked a little bit about cell phone conversations. You talked about like the Bluetooth headset and talking like in the supermarket or whatever. What? What do you want? Psst. Psst cat. Um, I work in a grocery store, as we know, and I see people talking on their Bluetooth headsets all the time. Often, I will, like, I'll be working here, someone will come up from out of my periph, and they're talking, and I'll be like, can I help? Oh, you are talking to yourself. Because <laughs> I think they're talking to me, but they're talking to a headset. And you were talking about, like, um, being rude and like what's appropriate, where, where, where talking is appropriate and where it's not. And I've given up like holding society to any kind of like, it's, it, <clears throat> I can't get offended at people using their cell phone everywhere, but I don't do it myself. I base, I heart, I pretty much treat my phone like, um, my house phone, like, I only answer it when I'm at home <laughs> and it's not late and like most of the time people don't call me anyway. I, I barely ever talk on my phone. Most of the time it's for text communicate text based communication, whether that's email or Twitter or instant message or, or text. Like it's mostly text for me. I don't I don't really participate in on auditory conversations on my phone anymore. I do think it's like annoying how much people use them, but I, I've given up. Can't control it. And what's the point in caring? Because it's just going to get worse. Um, also, your, your uh, discussion of the Google Glass uh, project, I think, was maybe a little misinformed. They're not glasses. They are a frame that sits on top of your ears and then your nose. So I think the idea is that if you're wearing glasses, they're just going to go on top of the frame and they're going to, because the only thing that you're looking through is this tiny little block and it goes right in front of your right eye. And um, if you're wearing glasses, it's just going to go right in front of your glasses. I don't know how that's going to work with people with prescriptions like Ron, Ron brought up, because if your eyesight is really bad, if you have like a nearsighted, farsighted thing where you have like um, uh, bifocals, this, 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 you'll never be able to use this thing. It just won't work. All right, so anyway, um, Sandman. Shoot, I forgot a prop. Okay, so <laughs> I meant to get these before I turned on the camera. I have in my Dominion all of the Sandman books. Have I ever read a single one of them? No. <laughs> I'll tell you why I have them. They're not mine. They are my wife's. When we first met, this will this this is a huge discussion that we re really should have on a on a video somewhere. Um, when we first met, our very first date, she came over to my place and we watched Sandman because we realized in the week prior to that, as we we knew we knew each other for a very short time before we started dating. Um, in the week prior to that, we had established that we both liked Neil Gaiman, not Gaiman, and we were talking about American Gods, because I, I was fresh off of that. I just read it. In fact, that's that was my only Neil Gaiman experience at that point. I've gotten more versed since then. And uh, we talked about she had never experienced Sandman. She, didn't, she knew about it, but she'd never read it. And I had 
recently gotten really into graphic novels. I had read Watchmen, and I read Frank Miller's Batman, and I read um, a bunch of stuff by... Shoot, who's the guy who wrote V for Vendetta? Well, that guy. And um, she, she hadn't read no graphic novels. And so when we started dating, the very first gift I ever gave her was the first two books of Sandman, which are... Uh, Preludes and Nocturnes, and The Doll's House. And then, I don't remember what, that that was probably, it was probably for Christmas or something, because we started dating in November. So then for like, Valentine's Day, what a sweetheart romantic I am, I got her the next two books. And then, oh no, it was for her birthday, which is right before Valentine's Day. And then like, for the next holiday, I got her the next two books. And now she has the whole collection, she's read the whole thing. I've read none of them. I would love to, um... As far as turning it into a movie, I have no idea what's going on with that. I know American Gods is being adapted into an HBO show. So if you didn't know that, you should be excited. American Gods is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Ron's uh, skepticism of the two movies that we're excited for. Ron, I don't think you understand why we're excited for them. It's not because they're Batman and the Avengers. It's because it's Chris Nolan and Joss Whedon. Like, these people have amazing track records that... You saw The Dark Knight, right? You know why we're excited for The Dark Knight Rises? It, it, you were like, it's either going to be really good or it's going to suck. You think it's possible that a Chris Nolan movie could suck? Carter, sick him. Um, emo started in the 1980s, look it up. Um, I would attribute it to things as far back as, like, The Cure. But um, the modern emo movement is, like, after post-hardcore... So, like, 2000, 2000-ish. Like, that was about when the, like, modern emo thing started. I don't, I don't know that much about it. I know music. That's the only reason I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an emo kid. Uh, you had a great intellectual property discussion. I hate intellectual property discussions. Um, I'm going to be on a new podcast soon uh, called Guys Night. I did this podcast with Dave Moulton. He was a guest on Sean Carter of a podcast. I was on his podcast, The Langcast. He and his partner and another guy and me are going to do a podcast called Guys Night. They already have two episodes, and I listened to the first one, and there's so much discussion in there about intellectual, intellectual property that is interesting, and I'll listen to it, but I don't want to get involved. I, 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 can't, I can't talk about it, probably because I'm a creator. It's because of things like girl talk. Like, I love girl talk. I love really good mashups. I really good. I I, bleh, I love really good appropriation of materials for new purposes. But I'm a creator, and if people started taking my stuff and just remixing it and doing it under all the all the fair use laws, like you know, you can't use a, a portion over however many seconds, or you can't do whatever. Like there are there are pretty specific guidelines about how you can. <clears throat> can't get away with it. Um, and it's not like it, they're completely different from the source material. Like, Girl Talk Music sounds nothing like the original music. He just tears apart original music and puts it back together. But he doesn't have to pay the original artists anything. And Elaine's right that everything's a remix and everyone's idea is everyone's idea, that whatever. But it's still frustrating for the guy who, like, would love to make a living off of, and I'm not talking about myself because I don't produce that much content. There's no way I can make a living off of what I'm doing. But there are people who do put out that effort and don't don't get anything. Uh, excuse me, don't get anything for it, and it's frustrating to watch. Anyway, that's why I don't get involved in those discussions. Um, you brought up Rousseau and Picasso, which actually uh, that was I forget what you were talking about between the intellectual property discussion and the art discussion, but I kind of tuned out. So, And then you, like, apologized for the art discussion, and I was like, no, no, that was good. That was when I started paying attention again. Um, I've actually seen a bunch of Rousseau, including The Sleeping Gypsy, in MoMA, where Alicia and I were just a couple months ago. There's a video about it somewhere. Um, in fact, Guys Night, I'll link the, the Guys Night podcast that I'm going to be on. I'm not on any of them now, and I'll link the uh, New York video that I made with Alicia. You won't get to see The Sleeping Gypsy because I didn't film a lot of the art. But um, 
the word, uh, oh, first of all, I also saw The Dream, which if you think The Sleeping Gypsy was a big painting, The Dream is freaking enormous. It would not fit in on any of the walls in this room. Maybe that one. It, it is enormous. Uh, and Ron asked what, like, he said it's realistic, but not really. Like, there's something about it that is off. And Elaine, the art, his, the art student, I thought you would give him, like, a name. Isn't this Impressionism? I'm pretty sure Rousseau did Impressionism. I think, what I think Impressionism, not an art student, what I think Impressionism is, is, like, it's based on reality. So I think of, like, Matisse with, like, isn't, isn't he the one who did, like, the big dabs of paint to, to create things? He did, like, the lily pads? Um, yeah, apparently I know a lot about art. Uh, impressionism is, like, when it looks kind of real. Like, you can, you can look at it and imagine what the real thing would look like, because everything in it is real, and it looks, it lo it's like a landscape or a person or something, but there's enough off about it that it has, like, a style to it. Um, and I think modern video games kind of do a similar thing. Star Wars The Old Republic does a great job of being, like, kind of real, but all the characters look slightly caricatured. No one actually looks like a real person in that game. Um, Borderlands is, like, kind of real, but everything's cel-shaded, so it has, like, a certain style to it to not give you this weird, uncanny feeling about how realistic it looks. Anyway, that's all of my art discussion. I should stop while I'm ahead. Um, Kim Stanley Robinson, I believe is the name of the guy who uh, wrote the book that Ron was talking about. He wrote a trilogy about Mars that my dad has probably read three freaking times, and I've never made it past the first book. I don't think I've even read half of the first book. Um, but it's a great, it's a, it's a series called Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, and it is about the terraforming and colonization of Mars, which, here we go with coincidences, completely ties into our discussion about colonizing other planets. Will, Ron, how bizarre that I don't think Ron realized that he was that close to linking to, to Ricari's question. Awesome. Uh, finally, the Fatboy Slim music video, I believe, is one of the greatest music videos ever made, and I was not laughing because you were wrong that it was Fat Boy Slim. I was laughing because I was like, damn it, now I'm going to have to go watch that video and I'm going to go watch it right now. You should too. That's it. See you next week for the next response. Click!